Act One of The Schoolmistress by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Schoolmistress, a Farce in Three Acts by Arthur Wynne Pinero. The Persons of the Play. The Honorable Vera Cricket, read by Peter Tucker. Miss Diod of Alumnia College for Daughters of Gentlemen. Read by Sonia. Admiral Rankling of Her Majesty's Flagship Pandora. Read by Son of the Exiles. Mrs. Rankling. Read by Abayi. Dinah. Read by Lian Yao. Mr. Reginald Parlover. Read by Thomas Peter. Peggy Hesleridge. An articled pupil. Read by Eva Davis. Lieutenant John Mallory. Of Her Majesty's flagship Pandora. Read by Nemo. Mr. Saunders. Mr. Mallory's nephew of the training ship Dextrous. Read by Chuck Williamson. Gwendolyn Hawkins. Read by Kieran Metz. Ermintrude Johnson. Read by Kalinda. Otto Bernstein. A popular composer. Read by Alan Mapstone. Tyler. A servant. Read by Rob Board. Jane Chapman. Read by Iki Tavi. Goff. Read by Recording Person. Jeffrey. Read by Sandra Schmidt. Stage Directions. Read by Todd. Act One. The Mystery. The scene is the reception room at Miss Diot's Seminary for Young Ladies, known as Volumnia College, Volumnia House, near Portland Place. The windows look on to the street, and a large door at the further end of the room opens to the hall, where there are some portmanteaus standing, while there is another door on the spectator's right. Jane Chipman, a stout, middle-aged servant, and Tyler, an unhealthy-looking youth wearing a page's jacket, enter the room, carrying between them a large travelling trunk. Old Ard! Old Ard! Oh, phew! They rest the trunk on the floor. Tyler dabs his forehead with a small, dirty handkerchief, which he passes on to Jane. Excuse me for not offering it to you first, Jane. Jane, dabbing the palms of her hands. Don't know me, Tyler. Do you happen to know what time this starts? Two thirty, I heard say. It's a queer thing, uh, going away like this alone. Not to say nothing of a schoolmistress leaving a lot of foolish young girls for a month or six weeks. Tyler, sitting despondently on the trunk. Cook and the parlour maid got rid of, too. It's not much of a Christmas vacation we shall get, you and me, Jane. You're right. Sitting on the sofa. Let's see. I mean, if our young ladies haven't gone on for their holidays. Well, there's Miss Hawkins. Our people is in India. Miss Johnson. Our people is in the divorce court. Miss Hesslerig. Oh, she ain't got no home. She's an orphan, studying for to be a governess. Then there's this new girl, Miss Ranklin. Dana Ranklin? Yes, Dina Ranklin. Now why is she to spend her Xmas at our college? She's the daughter of Admiral Ranklin, and the Ranklins live just round the corner at Collinwood House. Oh, she's been falling in love or something, and has got to be locked up. Well then, last but not least, there's the individual who is kicking his heels about the house and giving himself the airs of the haughty. Jane, mysteriously. What? Mrs. Husband? Yes, Mrs. His Husband. Ah, mark my word. If ever there was a mystery, there's one. Who is he? Mrs. brings him home about a month ago and doesn't introduce him to us or to nobody. The order is she's still to be called Miss Diet, and we don't know even his nasty name. Jane, returning to the trunk. She calls him Ducky. Yes, but we can't call him Ducky. Pointing to the handkerchief which Jane has left upon the sofa. My handkerchief, please. 
I don't let anybody use it. Jane, returning the handkerchief. Excuse me. In putting the handkerchief into his breast pocket, he first removes a handful of cheap-looking squibs. No, you're carrying deadly fireworks about with you, Tyler. Tyler, regarding them fondly. Fireworks is my only dissipation. There ain't much danger unless anybody lunges at me. Producing some dirty crackers from his trousers' pockets, and regarding them with gloomy relish. Friction is the risk I run. Jane, palpitating. Oh, don't, Tyler. I can have such an anchoring. Tyler, intensely. It's more than an anchoring. I love to hold em and mellow em. Today they're damp, tomorrow they're dry, and when the time comes for me to let em off... Then they don't go up? Tyler, putting the fireworks away. Perhaps not. And it's their horrible uncertainty what I crave after. Lift your end, Jane. They take up the trunk as Gwendolyn Hawkins and Ermatrude Johnson, two pretty girls, the one gushing, the other haughty in manner, appear in the hall. Here are Miss Dyot's boxes. She is really going today. I am so happy. What an inexpressible relief. Oh, Tyler, I am dissatisfied with the manner in which my shoes are polished. Yes, and, Tyler, you never fed my mice last night. It ain't my place. Birds and mice is Jane's place. Oh, you are an inhuman boy. Shaking Tyler. You are a creature. Don't shake him, miss. Don't shake him. Peggy Hesleridge enters through the hall and comes between Tyler and Glendlin. Peggy is a shabbily dressed, untidy girl with wild hair and inky fingers. Her voice is rather shrewish and her actions are jerky. Altogether, she has the appearance of an overwise and neglected child. Leave the boy alone, Gwendolyn Hawkins. What has he done? He won't feed my darling pets. And he is generally a lower order. Go away, Tyler. Tyler and Jane deposit the trunk in the hall with the other baggage and disappear. You silly girls. To make an enemy of the boy at the very moment we depend upon his devotion. It's just like you, Ermintrude Johnson. Don't you threaten me with your inky finger, Miss Hesleriga, please. Ugh! Haven't we sworn to help Dinah Rankling with our last breath? Haven't we sworn to free her from the chains of tyranny and oppression, and never to eat much until we've seen her safely and happily by her husband's side? Yes, but we can't truckle to a pale and stumpy boy, you know. We can. We've got to. If Dinah's husband is ever to enter this house, we must crouch before the instrument who opens the door, however short, however pasty. Dinah, calling outside. Are you there, girls? Peggy, jumping and clapping her hands. Here's Dinah. Dinah! Dinah. They run up to the door to receive and embrace Dinah, who enters through the hall. Dinah is an exceedingly pretty and simple-looking girl of about sixteen. We've been waiting for you, Dinah. And now you're going to keep your promise to us, ain't you? My promise? To tell us all about it from beginning to end. Dinah, bashfully. Oh, I can't. I don't like to. You must. We've only heard your story in bits. But where's Miss Diet? Out. Out. Out! And where is he, Miss Diet's husband? What, the mystery? Skipping across to the left-hand door, and, going down on her knees, peering through the keyhole. It's all right. One o'clock in the day, and he's not down yet. The imp. I'd cold sponge him if I were Miss Diet. Places, young ladies. Ermatrude sits with Dinah on the sofa. Gwendolyn being at Dinah's feet. Peggy perches on the edge of the table with her feet on a chair. <clears throat> now then, Mrs. What's your name, Dinah? Dinah, drooping her eyelids. Pullover. Mrs. Reginald Pullover. Attention for Mrs. Pullover's narrative. Chapter One. Well, dears, I met him at a party at Mrs. St. Dunstan's in the Cromwell Road. He was presented to Mamma and me by Major Padgate. Vote of thanks to Major Padgate. 
i wish we knew him young ladies well i bowed of course and then mr paulover mr paulover asked me whether i didn't think the evening was rather warm he soon began to rattle on then it was his conversation that attracted you i suppose oh no love came very gradually we were introduced at about ten o'clock and i didn't feel really drawn to him till long after eleven the next day being mars at home day major padgate brought him to tea young ladies what is your opinion of major padgate i think he must be awfully considerate he's not he called my reginald a young shaver that's contemptible enough how old is your reginald he is much my senior he was seventeen in november well the following week reginald proposed to me in the conservatory he spoke very sensibly about settling down and how we were not growing younger and how he'd seen a house in park lane which wasn't to let but which very likely would be to let some day and then we went into the drawing-room and told mamma well well, well? well? dinah breaking down and putting her handkerchief to her eyes oh i shall never forget the scene i never shall don't cry dinah they all tried to console her mamma who is very delicate went into violent hysterics and tore the hearth rug with her teeth but a day or two afterwards she grew a little calmer and promised to write to papa who was with a ship at malta and did she yes papa you know is admiral rankling his ship the pandora has never run into anything and so papa is a very distinguished man and what was his answer he telegraphed home one terrible word bosh oh oh, oh. He ought to be struck into a flying Dutchman. The telegraphic rate for Malta necessitates abruptness, but I can never forgive the choice of such a phrase. But it decided our fate. Three weeks ago, when I supposed to be selecting walls at Whiteley's, Reginald and I were secretly united at the registry office. Oh, how lovely! How romantic! We declared we were much older than we really are, but as Reginald said, trouble had aged us, so it wasn't a story. At the doors of the registry office, we parted. How horrible! I couldn't have done that. And when I reached home, there was a letter from Papa ordering Mamma to have me locked up at once in a boarding school. And here I am, torn from my husband, my letters opened by Miss Diet, quite friendless and alone. No, that you're not, Dinah. Listen to me. Miss Diet is going out of town today, and I'm left in charge. I'm a poor governess but playing jailer over bleeding hearts is not in my articles and if your husband comes to volumnia house and demands his wife he doesn't go away without you does he young ladies no we will do as we would be done by won't we yes the street door bell is heard the girls cling to each other oh 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 dinah trembling miss diet Tyler is seen crossing the hall. Peggy runs to the window and looks out. No, it isn't. It's the postman. A letter from Reginald. Tyler enters with three letters. Peggy, sweetly. Anything for us, Tyler, dear? Tyler, looking at the letters, which he guards with one arm. One for Miss Dina Ranklin? Oh. Snatching at her letter, which Tyler quickly slips into his pocket. My orders is to hand Miss Ranklin's letters to the missus. Handing a letter to Peggy. Miss Hesslerig. Peggy, surprised. For me. Tyler, looking at the third letter. Oh, look here, here's a go. What's, What's that? that? Tyler, dancing with delight. Oh, crikey, this must be for him. Miss Dyot's husband. The, the mystery. mystery. The girls gather round Tyler and look over his shoulder. Peggy, reading the address. It's re-addressed from the Junior Amalgamated Club, St. James Street. Snatching the letter from Tyler. Gracious, the Honorable Veer Queckett. The Honorable. The Honorable. What's that mean? Young ladies, we have been entertaining a swell unawares. Returning the letter to Tyler. Take it up. Swell or no swell, the person who soils two pairs of boots per diem daily is no friend of mine. Tyler goes out. 
Peggy, opening her letter. Oh, from Dinah's Reginald. No, no. Addressed to me. Referring to the signature. Reginald Percy Palover. Read it, read it. Peggy sits on the sofa, the three girls clustering round her, Dinah kneeling at her feet expectantly. Peggy, reading. Montpellier Square, West Brompton. Dear Miss Hesleridge, heaven will reward you. The letter wrapped round a stone which you threw me last night from an upper window of Volumnia House was handed to me after I had compensated the person upon whose head it unfortunately alighted. The news that Dinah has one friend in Volumnia House enabled me to get a little rest between half past five and six this morning. One friend. What about us? Dinah kisses them. Go on. Peggy, reading. Not having closed my eyes for eleven nights, sleep was of distinct value. Now, dear Miss Hesleridge, inform Dinah that our apartments are quite ready. Oh. oh. And that I shall present myself at Volumnia College to fetch away the dear love of my heart tonight at half past nine. Tonight. 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 Oh, I've come over so frightened. Tonight. Waving the letter and dancing round with delight. Finish the letter. Peggy, resuming her seat and reading with emotion. Please assure Dinah that I shall love her till death and that the piano is now moving in. Dinah is my one thought. The former is on the three years system. Kiss my angel for me. Our carpet is Axminster and I regret to say second hand. But oh. Our life will be a blessed, blessed dream, the worn part going well under the center table. This evening at half past nine, gratefully yours, Reginald Percy Pallover. P.S. I shall be closely muffled up, as the corner lamp post under which I stand is visible from the window of Admiral Rankling's dining room. You will know me by my faithful, trusty respirator. Oh, I'm so excited! I wish somebody was coming for me. I know. We shall be frustrated by Jane. Or Tyler. Leave them to me. I'll manage them. But there's Miss Dyett's husband. What? Let the mysterious person who has won Miss Dyett pause before he steps between a young bride and a bridegroom. Ladies, Miss Dyett's husband is ours for the holidays. One frown from him, and his dinner shall be wrecked his wine watered, his cigars dampened. He shall find us not girls, but gorgons. A loud knock and ring are heard at the front door. Jane crosses the hall. Ermatrude, Gwendolyn, and Dinah, under their breath, Miss Dyot! Miss Dyot! They quickly disappear. Peggy remains, hastily concealing the letter. Miss Dyot enters. She is a good-looking, dark woman of dignified presence and rigid demeanor, her dress and manner being those of the typical schoolmistress. Is that Miss Hesleridge? Peggy, demurely. Yes, Miss Dyot. How have the young ladies been employing themselves? I have been reading aloud to them, Miss Dyot. Is Mr. Que... is my husband down yet? I've not had the pleasure of seeing him, Miss Dyot. You can join the young ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Dyot. In the doorway, she waves Reginald's letter defiantly, but quickly disappears as Miss Dyot turns around. Now if Vere will only remain upstairs a few moments longer. She goes hurriedly to the left-hand door, listens, and turns the key, then to the center door, listens again, and appears satisfied, after which she throws open the window and waves her handkerchief, calling in a loud whisper, Mr. Bernstein! Mr. Bernstein! I have left the door on the latch. Come in, please. Closing the window and going to the door. Very shortly afterwards, Otto Bernstein, a little elderly German with the air of a musician, enters the room. Thank you for following me so quickly. Closing the door and turning the key. You seem so agitated that i came after your cab mit another agitated yes 
tell me miserable woman that i am tell me what did i sound like at rehearsal this morning capital capital your voice comes out rich and beautiful mark my word you will make a hit to-night have you seen your new name in the pills the pills the play pills i should drop flat on the pavement if i did it looks very fine quoting miss constance stella port as queen honorine in otto bernstein's new gomic opera pierrette her first appearance in london oh how disgraceful disgraceful to sing such melodies no no please disgraceful why did you appeal to me three weeks ago to put you in the way of getting through the christmas vacation miss diot tearfully oh you don't know everything sit down i can trust you you are my oldest friend and were a pupil of my late eminent father mr bernstein i am no longer a single woman oh i am very pleased i wish you many happy returns of the eh, no i congratulate you i am married secretly secretly because my husband could never face the world of fashion as the consort of the proprietors of a scholastic establishment you will gather from this that my husband is a gentleman hmm so is he it had been a long cherished ambition with me if ever i married to wed no one but a gentleman i do not mean a gentleman in a mere parliamentary sense i mean a man of birth blood and breeding respect my confidence i have wedded the honourable veer quacket bernstein unconcernedly ah uh, is he a very nice man nice mr bernstein you are speaking of a brother of lord limehouse oh am i lord limehouse let me think he is very very what you call it very popular just now yeah yeah he is in the bankruptcy courts miss diot with pride certainly so is harold archidec and quacket veer's youngest brother so is loftus martineau quacket veer's cousin they have always been a very united family but dear mr bernstein you have accidentally probed the one i won't say fault the one most remarkable attribute of these great saxon quackets oh yes i see you have to pay your husband's little pills quite so that is it i have the honour of being employed in the gradual discharge of liabilities incurred by mr veer quacket since the year eighteen seventy six i am also engaged in the noble task of providing mr quacket with the elaborate necessities of his present existence i know now why you wanted mine help ah yes volumnia college is not equal to the grand duty imposed upon it it is absolutely necessary that i should increase my income in my despair at facing this genial season i wrote to you proposing to turn your capital voice to account eh quite so and suggesting that i should sing in your new oratorio well you are going to do so what when you have induced me to figure in a comic opera yeah yeah but i have told you i have used the music of my new oratorio for my new gomic opera ah oh, yes that is my only consolation will your good gentleman be in the stalls to-night in the stalls at the theatre hush mr bernstein it is a secret from veer lest his suspicions should be aroused by my leaving home every evening 
i have led him to think that i am visiting a clergyman's wife at hereford i shall really be lodging in henrietta street covent garden oh why not tell him all about it oh, nonsense Veer is a gentleman he would insist upon attending me to and from the theatre well i should hope so no no he is himself a graceful dancer a common chord of sympathy would naturally be struck between him and the cory fees oh there is so much variety in veer's character well you are a plucky woman you deserve to be happy some day happy think of the deception i am practising upon dear veer think of the people who believe in the rigid austerity of caroline diod principal of volumnia college think of the precious confidence reposed in me by the parents and relations of twenty-seven innocent pupils give an average of eight and a half relations to each pupil multiply eight and a half by twenty-seven and you approximate the number whose trust i betray this night yes but think of the audience you will delight to-night in my oratorio i mean my comic opera oh that reminds me taking out a written paper from a pocket-book here are two new verses of the political song for you to commit to memory before this evening they are extremely good miss diot looking at the paper mr bernstein surely here is a veiled allusion to yes i thought so oh the unwarrantable familiarity i can't i can't even vocally allude to a perfect stranger as the grand old man oh now now he won't mind that but the tendency of the chorus reading doesn't he wish he may get it is opposed to my stern political convictions oh what am i coming to quacket's voice is heard quacket calling outside caroline caroline <gasps> yes veer hurriedly to bernstein good-bye dear mr bernstein you understand why i cannot present you bernstein bustling good-bye till to-night mark my word you will make a great hit caroline miss diot unlocking the centre door go let yourself out good luck to you miss diot opening the door yes yes and success to my new oratorio i, I mean my comic opera oh go she pushes him out and closes the door leaning against it faintly Quacket, rattling the other door. I say, Caroline! Miss Diot, calling to him. Is that my darling Veer? Yes! She comes to the other door, unlocks and opens it. Veer, Quacket, enters. He is a fresh, breezy, dapper little gentleman of about forty-five, with fair curly hair, a small waxed mustache, and a simple boyish manner. He is dressed in the height of fashion, and wears a flower in his coat, and an eyeglass. Good morning, Caroline. Good morning. How is my little pet today? Kisses his cheek, which he turns to her for the purpose. Not if he is down later than usual. It isn't my fault, dear. The florist was late in sending my flower. What a shame. Quacket, shaking out a folded silk handkerchief. By the by, Carrie, I want some fresh perfume in my bottles. My Veer shall have it. Thank you. Thank you. Sitting before the fire, opening the newspaper, and humming a tune. Let me see, let me see. Uh, here we are. Court of bankruptcy, before the official receiver. Limehouse came up again for hearing yesterday. How they bother him. They bothered me in 75 now here's a coincidence carrie in 1875 my assets were nil in 1885 dear old bob's assets are nil now that's deuced funny Via dear have you forgotten what today is quacket referring to the head of paper 
december the twenty-second yes but it's the day on which i am to quit my veery oh you stuck to going then well i dare say you're right you know you've a very bad cold nothing like change for a bad cold change of scene change of pocket handkerchiefs and so on but you don't say anything about your own lonely christmas i have married a man who is too unselfish the centre door opens slightly and the heads of the three girls peggy gwendolen and ermatrude appear one above the other spying quacket putting down his paper lonely by jove these inquisitive pupils of yours won't let a fellow be lonely upon my soul they are vexing girls but they are a source of income dear they are a source of annoyance i've never had the measles i've half a mind to catch it and give it to em now if i could only while away my evening somewhere these vexing girls wouldn't so much matter he rises the heads disappear and the door closes listening what was that the front door i think i thought it might be those vexing girls they're always prying about i was going to say carrie why not let me withdraw my resignation at the junior amalgamated club and continue my membership ten guineas a year for such an object i cannot afford and will not pay veer upon my soul i might just as well be nobody the way i'm treated oh my king don't say that have you thought about the christmas expenses frankly my dear i have not have you forgotten that my rent is due on friday completely and then think only think of your boots oh dash it all what man of any position ever thinks of his boots producing a letter the fact is caroline i have had a note sent on to me from the club by my friend jack mallory he's first lieutenant on the pandora you know and just home after four years at malta he reached london yesterday and writes me reading now old chap do let's have one of our old rollicking nights together and what eh correcting himself he writes me referring to the letter now old chap do let me give you the details of our new self-loading eighty-ton gun well carrie what the deuce am i to do it seems a nice gun she shrugs her shoulders carrie what is your veer to do she makes no answer he approaches her and touches her on the shoulder carrie carrie look at your veer veer speaks to you he sits on her lap she looks up affectionately carrie darling you know old jack is such a devil eh a nice devil you know an exceedingly nice devil now i can't show up at the club after sending in my resignation they'd quiz me awfully but i must entertain poor old jack coaxingly eh resignation sent in through misunderstanding eh pinching her cheek ten little guinea winnies eh not a guinea winnie for a club not half a guinea winnie caroline you forget what is due to me i wish i could forget what is due to everybody don't be cross veer i'll fetch your head and coat and veer shall go out for his little morning stroll and if he promises not to be angry with his caroline there are five shillings to spend she gives him some silver he looks up beamingly again my darling miss diot taking his face between her hands and kissing him oh you spoiled boy she runs out what am i to do about jack i can't ask him here carrie would never allow it and if she would i couldn't stand the chaff about marrying a boarding school no i can't ask jack here why can't i ask jack here everybody in bed at nine o'clock square the boy tyler to wait bachelor lodgings near portland place extremely good address jack shall give me the details of that eighty-ton gun 
Yes, and we'll load it, too. While I'm out, I'll send this wire to Jack. Quackett, taking a telegraph form from the stationery cabinet and writing, Come up tonight, dear old boy. 9.30 sharp. Diggings of humble bachelor. 80 Duke Street, Portland Place. Bring two or three good fellows. Veer. How much does that come to? Counting the words rapidly. One, two, three, four, five. No. Getting confused. One, two, two, three, four, five, six. No. One, two, three, four, five, six. Counting to the end. I think it is one and something halfpenny, but it's all luck under the new regulations. Oh, and I haven't addressed it. Where's Jack's letter? He takes the letter from his pocket. Peggy enters quietly. Seeing Quecket, she draws back, watching him. Peggy, to herself. What is he doing now, the guy fox? Quecket, referring to the letter. Ah, Rover's Club. Addressing the telegram. John Mallory, Rover's Club. Let me see. That's in Green Street, Piccadilly. Writing. Green Street, Piccadilly. Or am I thinking of the stragglers? I've a club list upstairs. I'll go and look at it. Humming an air, he shuts up the telegraph form in the blotting book and rises, still with his back to Peggy. <laughs> I feel so happy. He goes out. Peggy advances to the blotting book, carrying some luggage labels. Miss Dyot has sent me to address her luggage labels. I am compelled to open that blotting book. She sits on the chair lately vacated by Quecket, and opens the blotting book mischievously with her forefinger and thumb. Seeing the telegraph form, Ah! Reading it greedily with exclamations, Oh, dear old boy! Oh, diggings of humble bachelor! Oh, bring two or three good fellows! Oh, oh! sticking the telegraph form prominently against the stationery cabinet, facing her, and addressing a luggage label. Miss Dyot, passenger to Hereford. Quackett, re-entering gaily. It is in Green Street, Piccadilly. He sees Peggy and stands perplexed, twisting his little mustache. Peggy, writing solemnly. Miss Dyot. Passenger to Hereford. Quackett, coughing anxiously. <coughs> I fancy I've left an eighty-ton gun. I mean, I think I've mislaid a... Uh... Without looking up, Peggy readjusts the telegraph form against the cabinet. Oh, <laughs> that's it. He makes one or two fidgety attempts to take it, when Peggy rises with it in her hand. She reads it silently, forming the words with her lips. Oh, you vexing girl! What do you think of doing about it? She commences to fold the form very neatly. You know I shan't send it. I never meant to send it. I say I shall not send it. Nervously holding out his hand. Shall I? Peggy doubles up the form into another fold without speaking. You are a vexing girl! Miss Dyot, calling outside. Miss Hesloridge. Peggy quietly slips the telegraph form into her pocket. Oh, you won't tell my wife. You will not dare to tell my wife. Will you? Miss Dyot calling again. Miss Hesloridge. Quacket in agony. Oh! Between his teeth. Do you... Do you know any bad language? I went to the Lord Mayor's show once. I heard a little. Then I regret to say I use it to you, Miss Hesselrig. I use it to you. Miss Dyot enters, carrying Quackett's hat, gloves, and overcoat. You can address the labels in another room, Miss Hesselrig, please. Quackett, to himself. 
Will she tell? Peggy to herself. He is in our power. Peggy goes out. Miss Diot, putting the hat on Quackett's head. You look sickly, my dear. I shall be better after my stroll, Carolyn. A knock and ring are heard. Miss Diot, assisting Quackett with his overcoat. As you have some solitary evenings before you, you may lay in a few cigars, dear darling. Thank you, Carrie. Miss Diot, helping him to put on his gloves like a child. But for the sake of our depressed native industries, I beg that you will order those of purely British origin and manufacture. Tyler enters, carrying a large common black tea tray upon which is a solitary visiting card. Where's the salver, you bad boy? Tyler, pointing to Quackett sullenly. He slopped his chocolate over it. Miss Diot, taking the card. Admiral and Mrs. Ranklin. Dinah's parents. I must see them. Quackett, hastily turning up his collar to conceal his face. No, no! They know me! They're old friends of my family's. Tyler shows in Admiral and Mrs. Rankling. Mrs. Rankling is a thin, weak-looking, faded lady, with a pale face and anxious eyes. She is dressed in too many colors, and nothing seems to fit very well. Admiral Rankling is a stout, fine old gentleman, with short, crisp gray hair and fierce black eyebrows. He appears to be suffering inwardly from intense anger. My dear Mrs. Rankling. The ladies shake hands. Tyler goes out. Mrs. Rankling, pointing to Rankling. This is Admiral Rankling. Miss Diot bows ceremoniously. Rankling returns a slight bow and glares at her. Miss Diot to Mrs. Rankling. Pray sit by the fire. As the ladies move to the fire, Quackett, who has been watching his opportunity, creeps round at the back and goes out. Mrs. Rankling, warming her feet at the fire. The Admiral has called upon you, Miss Diot, with reference to our child, Dina. Rankling, with a smothered explanation of rage, sits on the sofa. Whom we find the charming daughter of charming parents. Rankling gives her a fierce look, which frightens Miss Diot, who is most anxious to conciliate the Admiral. Dina's obstinacy is a very serious shock to the Admiral, who is naturally unused to insubordination. Naturally. Rankling glares at her again. She puts her hand to her heart. The Admiral has been stationed with his ship at Malta for a long period. In fact, the Admiral has not brightened our home for over four years. How more than delightful to have him with you again. Rankling gives Miss Diot a fearful look. She clutches her chair. The Admiral has one of those fine English tempers. Generous but impetuous. You may guess the sad impression Dina's ingratitude has produced upon him. It is an open secret that the Admiral made three wills yesterday, and read King Lear's curse after supper in place of thanksgiving. Rankling, sharply. Emma! Mrs. Rankling, starting. Yes, Archibald? Live the fire. You'll be chilled when we go. Come over here. Yes, Archibald. Crossing the room in a flutter, and sitting beside Rankling, who makes insufficient room for her. Thank you, Archibald. I have been sitting up with the Admiral all night, and it is owing to my entreaties that he has consented to give Dina one last chance of reconciliation. Rankling, who has been eyeing her. Emma! Yes, Archibald? You're Bonnet's on one side again. Mrs. Rankling, adjusting it. Thank you, Archibald. We leave town for the holidays tomorrow. It rests with Dina whether she spends Christmas in her papa's society or not. Don't twitch your fingers, Emma. Don't twitch your fingers. Mrs. Rankling, nervously. It's a habit, Archibald. That's a very bad one. 
all we require is that dina should personally assure us that she has banished every thought of the foolish young gentleman she met at mrs st dunstan's miss diot rising and ringing the bell if i am any student of the passing fancies of a young girl's mind speak louder madam your voice doesn't travel miss diot nervously with a gulp <laughs> if i am any student of the passing fancies rankling puts his hand to his ear oh don't make me so nervous jane enters looking untidy her sleeves turned up and wiping her hands upon her apron miss diot shocked where is the manservant on errand ma'am ask miss dinah rankling to be good enough to step downstairs jane goes out rankling rises with mrs rankling clinging to his arm you will be calm archibald you will be moderate in tone <coughs> oh dear poor dina stop that fidgety cough emma stalking about the room his wife following him even love matches are sometimes very happy our was a love match archibald be quiet where exceptions pacing up to the door just as it opens and peggy presents herself directly rankling sees peggy he catches her by the shoulders and gives her a good shaking admiral archibald peggy being shaken uh, 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 uh. rankling panting and releasing peggy you good-for-nothing girl do you know you've upset your mother archibald that isn't dina that is another young lady rankling aghast what not who who has led me into this unpardonable error of a judgment mrs rankling to peggy who was rubbing her shoulder and looking vindictively at rankling oh my dear young lady pray think of this only as an amusing mistake the admiral has been away for more than four years dina was but a child when he last saw her <sighs> oh dear me be quiet emma you'll make a scene miss diot to peggy where is miss rankling miss rankling presents her compliments to miss diot and her love to her papa and mamma and as her mind is quite made up she would rather not cause distress by granting an interview rankling sinks into a chair archibald miss diot to peggy the port wine peggy advances with the cake and wine mrs rankling kneeling to rankling archibald be yourself remember you have to respond for the navy at a banquet to-night think of your reputation as a genial after-dinner speaker rankling rising with forced calmness thank you emma to miss diot madam my daughter is in your charge till you receive instructions from my solicitor glaring at peggy a short written apology will be sent to this young lady in the course of the afternoon to his wife emma your hair's rough come home he gives mrs rankling his arm they go out miss diot sinks exhausted on sofa peggy offers her a glass of wine oh my goodness declining the wine no no not that it has been decanted since midsummer quacket his coat collar turned up appears at the door looking back over his shoulder what's the matter with the ranklings seeing miss diot and peggy oh has that vexing girl told carola the clock strikes two miss diot to herself two o'clock i must remove to henrietta street seeing quacket my darling my love to himself all right i am going to prepare for my journey the train leaves paddington at three as miss diot goes toward the centre door 
Jane enters, carrying about twenty boxes of cigars, which she deposits on the floor, and then goes out. What is this? Hmm. My cigars, Carrie. Brought them with me in a cab. Oh. Reading the label on one of the boxes. Poor Carolina. Ah, poor Caroline. She goes out. Directly she is gone, Peggy and Quecket, by a simultaneous movement, rush to the two doors and close them. Now, Miss Hazelrig. Sir. We will come to a distinct understanding. If you please. In the first place, you will return me my telegram. I can't. You mean you won't? No, I can't. Why not? I have just sent it to the telegraph office by Tyler. Dispatched it? Dispatched it. It was one and fourpence. Oh, you, you, you vexing girl. Mr. Mallory will be here tonight. Yes, and we'll bring two or three good fellows. At least we hope so. Hope so? Peggy, standing over him with her arms folded. Listen, Mr. Veer Quicket. He starts. We ladies are going to give a little party tonight to celebrate a serious event in the life of one of us. We have invited only one young gentleman. Your friends will be welcome. Oh? Without us, your party must fail, for we command the servants. Let it be a compact. Your soiree shall be our soiree, and our soiree your soiree. And if I indignantly decline? Peggy, solemnly. Consider, Mr. Quackett, your Christmas holidays are to be passed with us. Think in which direction your comfort and freedom lie, in friendship or in enmity. Even now, Ermintrude Johnson is trimming the holly with one of your razors. But what explanation could I give Mr. Mallory of your presence here? Every detail has been considered. You are our bachelor uncle. Uncle? We are your four nieces. Quackett looks up, is tickled by the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see why that shouldn't be rather jolly. Peggy, roguishly. Do you consent? Can't help myself, can I? Peggy, delighted. That you can't. Let's be friends, then, shall we? Have you girls got any money? No. Have you? No. That is, all mine's invested. Miss Diot, outside. Tyler, fetch a cab. Quackett makes a bolt from the room, and Peggy vigorously rearranges the furniture as Miss Diot enters dressed as if for a journey, and carrying her umbrella and handbag again. Where is my husband? Peggy, looking about her. Your handbag, Miss Diot? Quackett re-enters. Still in your overcoat, dear? Of course, Carrie. I'll drive with you to Paddington. No, no. I insist on going alone. Quackett, taking off his coat with alacrity, Carrie, I am disappointed. Dinah, Gwendolyn, and Ermatrude come through the hall into the room and form a group. Jane enters the hall. Tyler joins her there. Miss Hesleridge, young ladies, I regret to say I am compelled to... to quit Volumnia House for a time. The length of my absence depends upon how long it runs... Correcting herself in confusion. Upon how long it runs to it to employ a colloquialism of the vulgar but i depart with a light heart because i leave my husband in authority he will find a trusty lieutenant in miss hesleridge ladies to abandon for the moment our mother tongue je vous embrasse de tout mon coeur soyez sage au revoir, Au revoir mademoiselle bon voyage mademoiselle Peggy joins the girls and they talk earnestly. A cabman is seen carrying out the boxes from the hall, assisted by Tyler. Miss Diot produces some paper packets of money from her handbag. Miss Diot, as she gives the packets to Quackett, Veer, 
the house agent will apply for the rent there it is our fire insurance expired yesterday post the premium to the eagle office at once jane's wages are due next week deduct for the broken water bottle when you need exercise dear one tidy up the backyard the recreation ground a charwoman assists jane on fridays three quarters of a day and leaves before her tea good-bye veer the cabs are waiting ma'am miss diot takes quackett's arm good-bye miss diot good-bye miss diot good-bye miss diot good miss, good miss diot and quackett go out through the hall peggy ermertrude and gwendolen run over to the windows and look out dinah sits apart thinking there they are miss diot's in the cab she's off Quackett returns. The girls surround him demonstratively. Dinah, young ladies. Pointing to Quackett. Uncle Veer. Uncle Veer. Uncle Veer. Quackett tries to maintain his dignity and pushes the girls from him. Tyler, with Jane, is seen letting off a squib in the hall. End of the first act. Act Two of The Schoolmistress by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Second Act The Party. The scene is a plain looking schoolroom of Miss Diot's. Outside the two windows runs a narrow balcony and beyond are seen the upper stories and roofs of the opposite houses. There are two doors facing each other. The room is decorated for the occasion with holly and evergreen, and a table is laid with supper. Peggy is standing on a chair with a large hammer in her hand, nailing up holly. Peggy, surveying her work, There, I'm sure Miss Dyer wouldn't recognize the dull old classrooms. Descending, I think it's time I dressed. Quackett enters slowly. He is in a perfectly fitting evening dress, with a flower in his buttonhole, but looks much depressed. He and Peggy regard each other for a moment silently. Oh, I'm so glad you're ready early. How good it makes one feel giving pleasure to others, doesn't it? Aren't you well? Yes. No. I deeply regret plunging into the vortex of these festivities. Oh, I suppose you're nervous in society. Quackett, drawing himself up. Nervous in society, Miss Hesselrig. What do you think of the decorations? Artistic, aren't they? A treat at a Sunday school. Then you shouldn't have locked up the rooms downstairs. I daren't allow the neighbours to see the house lighted up downstairs. I wish I could have locked up all you vexing girls. That's not the spirit to give a party in. Contemplating the table. How many do you think your friend, Mr. Mallory, will bring? I don't think Mr. Mallory will find his way here at all. Have you observed the fog? Is it foggy? You can't see your hand before you outside. I sincerely hope my friend will not come. There's hospitality. Ours will. Who is your friend? Mr. Pallover. And who the devil is... I don't think that's the language for a party, Mr. Quicket. I beg your pardon. Who is Pallover? Tyler enters with a bill in his hand, with his hair stiffly brushed and greased, and wearing an expression of intense wonderment. What's this? A beautiful large lobster salad is come, sir. Quackett, looking at Peggy. I haven't ordered a lobster salad. In an undertone. You know, this is getting extremely vexing. He takes from his pocket the packets of money previously given to him by Miss Diot. I've already paid a bill for some oysters and a pâté de foie gras. Jane's wages went for that. Opening a packet. Now here's a salad. That breaks into next week's household expenses. Handing the money to Tyler, who goes out. 
we're only girls you know and you seem to forget you're our uncle quacket irritably i am not your uncle tonight you are but you needn't be our uncle tomorrow somebody will have to be my uncle tomorrow then i understand there's a lark pudding ordered for half past nine i can't allow the account to be sent in to 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 auntie well to to auntie who pays for the lark pudding you couldn't well ask girls to do it besides it's your party it is not my party and it is your lark pudding it may be our lark but it's your pudding tyler enters still much astonished and with another bill quacket taking the bill what's that such a lot of champagne's come sir champagne who ordered that i didn't hush i did i did i did then it is your party part of the party is my party opening another packet i've broken into the rent he hands tyler the bill and some money pocketing the remainder tyler goes out the fire insurance alone remains intact opening the last packet postal orders for thirty shillings i'll dispatch that at any rate he sits at the writing table and begins to write peggy hammers up the last piece of holly as quacket tries to write oh you vexing girl beg pardon this is the last blow she gives another knock as jane enters carrying a large ornamental wedding cake jane is in a black gown and smart cap and apron her eyes are wide open with pleasure and astonishment jane deposits the cake upon the writing table before quacket excuse me sir the confection is just brought for thanks what's that that isn't the lark pudding oh lord no sir she goes out oh that's the wedding cake oh come it isn't my wedding cake oh don't you funny man no it's mr palover's who the dev hush let's settle one thing at a time who is Paulover? Dear Dinah's husband. Dear Dinah. Your niece, Dinah Rankling. Married. Secretly to Mr. Paulover. Quacket puts his hand to his brow. Oh, that's old Paulover, is it? Young Paulover. They were married really three weeks ago, but without any breakfast. I don't mean a bacon breakfast. I mean a proper breakfast. But we girls think they ought to have a wedding cake and everything complete to start them in life together. And that's why you're giving this party, you know. Now, understand me. I will not be dragged into such a conspiracy. But you're in it. The Ranklings are acquaintances of mine, almost relatives. Admiral Rankling's cousin married the sister of the man who bought my brother's horses rubbing his hands together i wash my hands of all you vexing girls don't fret about it please nothing can ever make mrs Pollover miss rankling again i'll go and dress while you finish your letter Ooh. he resumes writing at the table peggy going to the door the girls will be here directly be nice won't you she goes out Jane enters with tarts and confectionery on dishes which she places on the table before Quacket. Excuse me, sir. Quacket rises with his letter and the inkstand, and goes impatiently over to the other side of the room, where he continues writing on top of the piano. They won't let me write to the insurance office. Tyler enters with some boxes of bonbons. The writing table being crowded, Jane waves him over to the piano and goes out. Tyler puts the bonbons on the top of the piano before Quacket, who snatches up his letter and the inkstand again, and goes to the center table. I will write to the insurance office. Tyler goes out as Jane re-enters. Jane, presenting a bill. The pastry cook's bill, sir. Great Scott! Diving his hand into his pocket, bringing out some loose money and giving it to Jane. There! Jane goes out. 
I've written to the insurance office. Sealing the letter. My mind's easy. Done my duty to poor Carolyn. He puts the letter in his breast pocket as Tyler enters. Tyler, more astonished than ever, announcing, Miss Gwendolyn Hawkins. Gwendolyn enters, dressed in a simple and pretty party dress. Tyler goes out. Gwendolyn, bashfully, seeing nobody but Quecket. Oh, I'm first. I shall come back again. She is going. Come in, come in. How do you do? Gwendolyn advances. Quecket shakes hands with her. Delighted to see you. So glad you've come. Won't you sit down? To himself with satisfaction. Illustrations of deportment and the restrictions of society. Dear Quecket, Carrie would be delighted. Tyler re-enters, still more astonished. Miss Hermintrude Johnson and, and, and Mrs. Reginald Paulover. This is a little too vexing. Ermatrude and Dinah enter, both prettily dressed. Dinah in white. Tyler goes out. How do you do? So glad you've come. Won't you sit down? We're very well, thank you. Awfully well. They sit, the three girls in a row. Dinah in the center, Gwendolyn and Ermatrude taking her hands. Quecket, to himself. Instructions in polite conversation. Brusquely to Dinah. How is Paul over? Oh, I think he's very well, thank you. Quecket, to himself. Carrie would be pleased. To the girls. Hmm. I suppose you young ladies distinctly understand that I occupy a painfully false position this evening. I am sure it is very, very kind of you to give this party. Quecket, to himself. Well, now, that's exceedingly appropriate the way in which that is put. Carrie really does do her duty to the parents of these girls. Peggy says you insist on our calling you uncle. Does she? To himself. Peggy is the one I've turned against. We think you'll be an awfully jolly uncle. Quecket, pleased. Thank you. Thank you. To himself. I begin to like helping Carrie with the pupils. Peggy enters. She is quaintly but untidily dressed in poor, much-worn, and old-fashioned finery. In her hand she carries a pair of soiled, long white gloves. Hello. Without speaking a word, Peggy hurries across the room and goes out. What is the matter with that vexing girl now? Peggy re-enters with Tyler, pushing him forward. Tyler, announcing, Miss Margaret Hesslerig. Peggy advances to Quecket, holding out her hand. How do you do? Quecket, savagely. How do you do? Delighted to see you. For goodness sake, sit down. He turns away to the fire. The three girls rise to greet Peggy. Dinah, anxiously. I don't think it's nearly half past nine yet. Peggy, rather proudly, produces a huge old-fashioned watch. Twenty to ten. I thought it was. Dinah, Gwendolyn, and Ermatrude run to one window, pull aside the blind, and look out. Peggy goes to the other window, pulls up the blind, and opens the window. What are you doing? I can just see him under his lamp post. The fog will hurt him. Hush, I told him we'd whistle twice. Do it. <laughs> Girls, it's ominous. My whistle has left me. To Quecket, taking his arm. Come and whistle. No! No! Peggy, leading Quecket to the open window. Whistle, or you'll catch cold. Quecket whistles twice, desperately. <whistles> then returns to the fireplace, annoyed. He's heard it. She closes the window and pulls down the blind. Now, listen. To Gwendolyn and Ermatrude. You two girls, count five. One. Two. Oh, how slowly you count. Three. Four. Dinah, clasping her hands. Five. 
There is a distant ring at the bell. With a little cry, Dinah runs out. Peggy begins to put her gloves on. Ermatrude and Gwendolen go to the door, open it, and listen. Peggy, to quack it. Thank you for whistling. I shall never make a whistling woman, shall I? A wide knowledge of humanity, in its highest and lowest grades, Miss Hesselrig, does not enable me even to conjecture the possibilities of your future. No compliments, please. Thank you. She holds out her gloved hand for him to button the glove. After a look of astonishment, he complies. You know my idea about my future, don't you? No. That I only need one essential to become a duchess. What is that? A duke. They're coming upstairs. Peggy, to quack it. Now you'll see Mr. Pollover. Oh, I do hope he'll take to you. Well, really, I'm... He walks angrily away as Dinah enters with Reginald Pollover, a good-looking lad, rather sheepish when in repose, but fiery and demonstrative when out of temper. He is in evening dress, overcoat and muffler, and wears a respirator, which he removes on entering. Dinah, introducing the three girls. Reggie, these are my three dear friends. Miss Hawkins, Miss Johnson. Reginald, bowing. Awfully pleased to meet you. And Miss Hesselrig. Peggy advances and shakes hands with Reginald. Thank you very much for being so kind to my wife. Ermatrude, to Gwendolen, disappointed. No whiskers or moustache. Oh. Peggy. To Reginald. Had you been waiting long? Ten minutes. I was jolly glad to hear my wife's dear little whistle. I should know it from a thousand. <clears throat> Dinah, dear, make Mr. Pollover and Mr. Quecket known to each other. Quecket comes forward with a disagreeable look. Reginald glares at him. Dinah, timidly. Reggie, dear, this is Mr. Quecket. Quecket bows stiffly. Reginald nods angrily. Reginald, to Dinah. Dinah, what is a man doing here? You know I can't bear you to talk to a man. Oh, Reggie, why are you always so jealous? Mr. Quackett is giving the party. What party? Your wedding party. Is he? To Quackett, angrily. I'm much obliged to you, Mr. Quackett. Peggy. Pacifying Reginald. Mr. Quackett is so nice. He calls himself Dinah's uncle. Does he? Then it's a liberty. That's all I can say. Do you know you're in my house, sir? I'm not in your house, sir. Come away, Dinah. Hush. Mr. Quackett is Miss Diots. Be quiet. Mind your own business. Reginald to Quackett. At any rate, it's my business, sir. I'm afraid you're a cub, sir. What? Oh, Reggie, don't! A loud knock and ring are heard. Peggy, to Quackett. Your friend? Whose friend? My friend! Another man, I suppose. Dinah! Ladies, do explain everything to Mr. Pollover. Dinah seizes Reginald's arm. Gwendolyn and Ermatrude gather round them, Reginald protesting. Reginald, handing his card as he passes Quackett. My card, sir. Pooh! Sir. Throwing the card in the fire, the three girls hurry Reginald out of the room. Peggy, to Quackett. I'm so sorry. He hasn't taken to you. He needn't trouble himself. Upon my soul, this is going to be a nice party. Tyler enters. Three gentlemen, sir. I was to say the name of Mallory. Three gentlemen. Peggy, delighted, to Quackett. Oh, he's brought some good fellows. Reckoning on her fingers. That's one for Ermintrude, and one for me, and one for... Be quiet. To Tyler. I'll come down. Mallory, outside. Quackett. Yes, Jack? 
Jack Mallory enters. He is a good-looking jovial fellow of about thirty-six, with a bronzed face. He is in evening dress and overcoat. Tyler goes out. Mallory, shaking hands heartily with Quecket. Ah, Quecket, dear old chap. Well, I'm glad to see you. How are you, Jack? Quaint diggings you have up here. A hanging committee have shied you, though, haven't they? Seeing Peggy. I beg your pardon. Quacket, confused. Oh, uh, yes. I didn't mention it. I have my... my... nieces spending Christmas with me. Mallory, bowing to Peggy. Delighted. To Quacket. Did you say niece or nieces? Nieces. Softly to Peggy, quickly. How many? I forget. Three. Three. Three, not counting me. Three, not counting me. I mean three, not counting that vexing girl, Peggy. Margaret. Mallory, bowing. It would be impossible not to count Miss Margaret. Oh. Quacket assists Mallory to take off his overcoat, first darting an angry look at Peggy. Peggy, to herself. I shall give Gwendolen and Ermintrude the two that are downstairs. Hmm. You're not alone, are you, Jack? No, they're coming up. Quacket, grimly. Are they? The old gentleman takes his time with the stairs. Quacket, with forced ease. Poor old gentleman. Who the deuce... The fact is... There's been a big Navy dinner tonight in the Whitehall rooms. The enthusiasm became rather forced. Britannia rules the waves and all that sort of thing. So I gladly thought of finishing up with you. I've brought my nephew. Hello, here he is. Mr. Saunders enters. He is a pretty boy, almost a child, in the uniform of a naval cadet. My nephew. Horatio Nelson Drake Saunders, of the training ship Dexterous. Saunders, with the airs of a little man. How do you do? Awfully pleased to come here. Glad to see you, Mr. Saunders. Mallory, laughing, to Saunders. <laughs> I say, you shouldn't have left the old gentleman. <laughs> he sent me up to count how many more stairs there were. <laughs> Quacket, impatiently. Jack, I don't put the question on theological grounds, but who is the old gentleman? Oh, I beg your pardon, and his. We persuaded an old acquaintance of yours to join us. Admiral Rankling. What? Do you mind? Mind? Rankling, outside. Mr. Saunders! Here, sir. Peggy makes a bolt out of the room. Saunders goes to the door and returns with Rankling. Rankling is in evening dress, overcoat and muffler, and is much out of breath. Oh, Mr. Quackett, how do you do? We haven't met any well lately. I've been away, you know. I am delighted to renew our acquaintance, Admiral Rankling. Mr. Mallory suggested that we should smoke our last cigar at your lodgings. I can't stay, for I've a long way to drive home. At least I suppose I have, for I really don't know quite where we are. What quarter of London have you brought me to, Mr. Mallory? Oh, thank you. He turns to Saunders, who is offering to remove his overcoat. The door is slightly opened, and the heads of all the girls are seen. Quacket, hastily, to Mallory. He doesn't know where he is. The fog's as thick as a board outside. He isn't aware he lives a hundred and fifty yards off. No. Does he? Hush, don't tell him. Jack, don't tell him. I'll explain why by and by. Quacket turns to assist Saunders, who, mounted on a chair, is struggling ineffectually to relieve Rankling of his overcoat. Thank you. Bits of boys, bits of boys. Mallory, to himself... There's a wild look about poor Quecket I don't like. It's his lonely bachelor life, I suppose. 
curious place too he used to be such a swell in the albany looking about him the door shuts and the heads disappear rankling to quacket Lanky, Lanky. Oof. rankling sits down and mallory talks to him saunders has seated himself on the sofa and is dozing off quite tired out Ooh, what a party the door opens and peggy's head appears peggy hurriedly to quacket who'd have thought of this might be worse he doesn't recognize the house he is in doesn't he get rid of his daughter and that horrid pullover certainly not i know he won't recognize his daughter won't recognize his own door you drive me mad they continue to talk in undertones saunders is now fast asleep rankling to mallory no i don't like the look of poor quacket he seems altered altered he glares like the devil he's not married is he no then what does he mean by it queer rooms too catching sight of the wedding cake on the table lord look there mallory looking at the cake hello why it's like the thing we had at my wedding breakfast oh i should go no no the fact is poor old quacket has some nieces staying with him nieces four of em i've seen one and i fancy by the look of her mischievous little face that they're too much for him peggy to quacket leave everything to me don't spoil the party uncle dash the party peggy retiring hastily the door bangs at which rankling and mallory look round oh quacket where are your nieces 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 oh they retire at eight o'clock early to bed early to rise gwendolen and ermatrude enter visibly pushed on by peggy rankling rising um this doesn't look like early to bed quacket weakly just got up i suppose gwendolen ermatrude my dears admiral rankling mr mallory looking about for saunders mr mr oh mr saunders is asleep ermatrude and gwendolen advance to rankling rankling to the girls how do you do and whose daughters are you gwendolen and ermatrude look frightened and shake their heads Ooh, these are my sister isabel's girls why all your sister isabel's children were boys were boys yes rankling irritably ah boys sir are men now <laughs> hmm. i should have said these are my sister janet's children oh i've never heard of your sister janet no quiet retiring girl janet well then whom did janet marry whom didn't janet marry i mean whom did jane marry why finch griffin of the berkshire royals dear me we're going to meet major griffin and his wife on christmas day at the trotwells are you to gwendolen and ermatrude go away peggy enters oh <clears throat> this is margaret peggy oh another of mrs griffin's yes yes large family rapid to a year rankling eyeing peggy why we've met before today eh where at a miserable school near my house in portland place oh yes our holidays began this afternoon why quicket my daughter dyer and miss griffin are schoolfellows no yes no yes sir how small the world is do you happen to know anything about that person who keeps that school what's the woman's name miss miss 
Miss, Miss, Miss. Miss Diot. Oh, yes. Uncle knows her to speak to. What about her, Quacket? Quacket, looking vindictively at Peggy. Uh, um, rather not hazard an opinion. He hastily joins Mallory, Gwendolyn, and Ermatrude. Rankling, confidentially, to Peggy. Hmm, my dear Miss Griffin, did you receive a short but ample apology for me this afternoon, addressed to the young lady who was shaken? Yes, and oh, I shall always prize it. No, no, don't. You haven't bothered your uncle about it, have you, dear? No, not yet. I shouldn't, then, I shouldn't. He seems worried enough. Shall I take you and your sisters to see the pantomime? Yes, please. Then you'd better give me back that apology. Oh, no. You'd use it again. One, two, three. Mr. Mallory says you have four nieces with you, Mr. Quackett. Ah, but Jack's been dining, you know. I beg your pardon, Jack. Oh, yes, there is one more. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Parkinson is here with her husband. Hmm. My brother Tankerville's eldest girl. I've never heard of your brother Tankerville. No, he's deputy inspector of prisons in British Guiana. Quiet, retiring chap. I'll go and fetch them. She runs out. Quacket, to Rankling. To make a clean breast of it. The girls have been preparing a little festival tonight in honour of Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, the name Peggy mentioned. My niece was married, very quietly, some weeks ago to a charming young fellow. A charming young fellow. And these foolish children insist on cutting a wedding cake and all that sort of nonsense. I didn't want to disturb you with their chatter. You forget, Quackett. You are speaking to a father. No, I don't, indeed. Peggy re-enters, followed by Reginald and Dinah. My cousin and Mr. Parkinson. How do you... Staring. What an extraordinary likeness to my brother Ned. Taking her hand slowly, still looking at her. And how do you do? Dinah, palpitating. Thank you. I am very well. Do you know your voice is exceedingly like my sister Rachel's? Reginald, thrusting himself between Dinah and Rankling. I am sorry to differ. I think my wife resembles no one but herself. Rankling, hotly. I beg your pardon, sir. Reginald, hotly. Pray don't. Rankling, to himself. That's not a charming young fellow. Peggy, presenting Mallory to Dinah. Mr. Mallory. Mallory, gallantly, to Dinah. I'm delighted to have the opportunity of congratulating my old friend's niece upon her recent marriage. Taking her hand. I think myself especially fortunate in being present on such... Reginald, thrusting himself between Dinah and Mallory and giving Dinah his arm. How do you do, sir? Mr. Mallory, Mr. Parkinson. They bow abruptly, glaring at each other. Mallory, to himself. Is that a charming young fellow? Dinah expostulates in undertones with Reginald, he answering with violent gestures and glaring at Rankling, who mutters comments on Dinah's resemblance to various members of his family. Peggy endeavors to pacify Mallory, who is evidently annoyed, and altogether there is much hubbub, with signs of general ill-feeling. Quackett, sinking back in his chair. Ooh, what a party! Jane enters. Jane, quietly, to Quackett. The pudding is the airy, sir. Why ain't to be paid? I'll come to it. Jane goes out. To Peggy. Margaret, show Admiral Rankling and Mr. Mallory where the cigarettes are. They may like... 
to himself news are going off my life he goes out peggy to mallory may i take you to the cigarettes mallory to peggy you may take me anywhere oh to rankling the cigarettes are in the next room admiral rankling rankling not hearing peggy but still eyeing dinah what girl has a look of emma's sister susan peggy and mallory go out reginald seeing rankling is still looking at dinah abruptly takes her over to the door glaring at rankling as he passes reginald to dinah fiercely come away dinah dinah to reginald tearfully oh reggie dear reggie you are so different when people are not present they go out rankling watches them through the doorway gwendolen has meanwhile seated herself beside saunders whose head has gradually fallen till it rests upon her shoulder she is now sitting quite still looking down upon the boy's face ermatrude watching them enviously well considering that mr saunders was introduced to us asleep i don't think gwendolen's behavior is comme il faut she bumps gently against rankling oh rankling looking at ermatrude rather dazed my dear i am quite glad to see somebody who isn't like any of my relations come along they go out saunders moves dreamily and murmurs all right my dear i'll come down directly he raises his head and kisses gwendolen then opens his eyes and looks at her startled oh i've been dreaming about my ma i i don't know you do i it doesn't matter mr saunders you've had such a good sleep she kisses his forehead gently oh that's just like my ma where are the others gwendolen arranging his curls upon his forehead i'll take you to them thank you what's your name gwendolen Gwen's short for that, isn't it? Rubbing his eyes with his fist, then offering her his arm. Uh, permit me, Gwen. They go out. Quecket, his hair disarranged, his appearance generally wild, immediately enters, followed by Jane and Tyler. I can't help it. I'm in the hands of fate. Arrange the table. I cannot help it. Tyler and Jane proceed to arrange the table and the seats for supper. Peggy enters, quietly. It is supper time. Oh, what's the matter, Uncle Veer? Well, in the first place, there are no oysters. I've seen them. I've gone further. I've tasted them. Bad. Well, I should describe them as inland oysters. Long time since they had a fortnight at the seaside. Oh, dear. Then we must fall back on the lark pudding. You'll injure yourself seriously if you do. Tell me everything. It has not come small. It has come ridiculously small. It was ordered for eight persons. Then it is architecturally disproportionate. Peggy, to herself. Something must be done. She runs to the writing table and begins to write rapidly on three half-sheets of paper, folding each into a three-cornered note as she finishes it. The girls must be warned. Writing. For goodness sake, don't taste the pudding. Poor girls, what an end to a happy day. Quacket to himself. Oh, if the members of my family could see me at this moment. I, whose suppers in the Albany were at one time a proverb. Oh, Carolyn, Carolyn, even you little know the sacrifice I have made for you. Peggy, to Quacket, handing him the notes. Quick, please, quick, give them these notes. Quacket, taking the notes. What for? Oh, don't ask. You will see the result. But you mustn't write to people you... Go away! He hurries out. Peggy wipes her eyes. Oh, don't be upset, miss. No. I won't. But I am only a girl, 
and the responsibility is very great for such young shoulders there is a murmur of voices outside jane and tyler go out as rankling enters with ermertrude followed by reggie with dinah reginald is endeavouring to keep her away from mallory who comes after them saunders and gwendolen follow next and quecket brings up the rear there is much talking as quecket indicates the seats they are to occupy peggy quietly to quecket did you give the girls the notes quecket surprised no ah never mind i'll whisper to them now she whispers hurriedly to dinah gwendolen and ermatrude quecket to himself i didn't understand they were for the girls he goes to the head of the table as rankling mallory and saunders come suddenly together each carrying a note rankling to mallory mallory we were right there is some horrible mystery about quecket looking to see they are not observed i've had an anonymous warning for heaven's sake don't touch the pudding i know tell the boy mallory to saunders i say don't you say yes to pudding i know tell the old gentleman mallory to saunders he knows to rankling he knows with a simultaneous gesture they pocket the notes and go to find their seats at table they all sit the lobster salad and the pate have been placed by tyler at the end of the table tyler now enters carrying nine large plates which he places before quecket quecket with assumed composure and good spirits there is a spontaneity about our jolly little supper which will perhaps um, atone for any absence of elaboration don't name it mr quecket just as it should be my dear fellow tyler goes out the language of the heart is simplicity our little supper is from the heart ah i shall never forget your little suppers in the albany where were they from gunter's jack with a groan oh jane at the door hands to tyler a very small pudding in a silver basin which he places before quecket rankling mallory and saunders to themselves the, the pudding. pudding they exhibit great eagerness to get a view of the pudding peggy behind mallory's back oh how shameful it looks quecket faltering here is a homely little dish which has fascinations for many though i never touch it myself i never touch it myself rankling mallory and saunders exchange significant looks um a pudding made of larks he glances round all look down there is deep silence a pudding made of larks to dinah my dear a very little no thank you uncle perhaps you're right gwendolen a suggestion no thank you uncle quacket to peggy margaret i know what your digestion is i won't tempt you to ermatrude ermintrude the least in the world no thank you uncle quacket to himself ah how lucky peggy to herself brave girls i was afraid they'd falter quacket heartily now then admiral rankling no thank ye no pudding i haven't long dined thank you quacket quacket to reginald coldly may i reginald distantly i never ate suppers thank you quacket to saunders my dear mr saunders no mr quacket no thank you quacket getting desperate to mallory jack a lark no thanks old fellow well i throwing down his knife and spoon and leaning back in his chair to tyler take it away tyler removes the pudding they all watch it going tyler handing it to jane keep it warm jane 
Jack, a lobster salad and a small pâté de foie gras are at your end of the table. Mallory, looking round. May I? There is a general reply of, no, thank you, expressed in symbols by the ladies. Peggy, to herself. Poor girls, what sacrifices they make for these men. Mallory, with a plate in his hand. May I? Rankling, Saunders, and Reginald, together. No, no thank, thank you. you. Quackett, to himself. What a supper party. Tyler, the champagne. Tyler fetches a bottle of champagne and proceeds to open it. Rankling, behind Ermertrude and Peggy, to Mallory. If we see the cork drawn, shall we risk it? Risk it? Risk it. Reginald has risen from the table and is seen tapping Saunders upon the shoulder and speaking to him rapidly and excitedly. No, I have not. Talking together, Reginald and Saunders go out hurriedly. What's the matter with that charming young fellow now? To the table. Excuse me. He follows them out. Dinah, tearfully, to Gwendolen. Reginald's jealousy gets worse and worse. I am sure it will cloud our future. Gwendolen, to Dinah. Mr. Saunders wasn't looking at you, I am positive. The poor little fellow was stroking my hand. Mallory returns with Saunders and Reginald, who both look excited, and their hair is disarrayed. Reginald, to Mallory and Saunders. I beg your pardon. I may have been mistaken. I imagine that Mrs. Saunders was regarding my wife in a way which overstepped the borders of ordinary admiration. They hastily shake hands all around and hurry back to their seats. Tyler has poured out the champagne and now departs. Admiral Rankling rises. Quackett taps the table for silence. Please. Please. Ahem. Mallory, to himself. I thought the old gentleman wouldn't resist the temptation. My dear Mr. Quackett, it would ill become an old man, himself the father of a daughter, nearly, if not quite, of the age of the young lady opposite me, to lose an opportunity of saying a few words on the pleasant, the, the extremely pleasant condition of the British naval forces. Um, no, um. Mallory, to himself. I knew that would happen. Pardon me. I've been speaking on other subjects tonight. I should say, the extremely pleasant occasion which brings us together. Certainly, my dear Rankling. How nice of you. Not only am I the commander, uh, the father, of a ship, of a daughter, whom it is my ambition to see happily wedded to the man of her choice. Hear, hear. Quackett, in an undertone, glaring at her. You vexing girl. But I am also the husband of a heavily plated cruiser. Um, no, of a, of a dear, hum, of a dear lady to whose affection and society I owe the greatest happiness of my life. Peggy, to herself. How different some gentlemen are when their wives are not present. If I have the regret of knowing that my acquaintance with Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Parkinson. Thank you, I know, Parkinson. Has begun only tonight. I have also the pleasure of inaugurating a friendship with that delightful young lady, which on my side should be little less than paternal. I, I. Oh, gracious. I, I cannot sit down. Mallory, wearily. <sighs> Why not? I will not sit down without adding a word of congratulations to Mr. Mr. Parkinson. Thank you, I know, Parkinson. The young gentleman whose ingenious construction and seagoing qualities. No, no. Um, whose amiability and genial demeanor have so favorably impressed us. 
as an old married man, I welcome this recruit to the service. Hear, hear. It is one of hardship and danger, of stiff breezes and dismal night watches. But it is because Englishmen never know when they are beaten. No, no. Yes, sir, it is because Englishmen never know when they are beaten that they occasionally find conjugal happiness. I ask you all to drink to the Navy. To Mr. and Mrs. Thank you, I know. Jenkinson? All except Dinah and Reginald rise and drink the toast, Mr. and Mrs. Parkinson. Then, as they resume their seats, Reginald rises sulkily. Admiral Rankling? Jane appears at the door, wildly beckoning to Quecket. Sir! Sir! Not now! Not now! Go away! Hush! 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 The girls motion Jane away. She retires. Quecket to Reginald. I beg pardon. All I have to say is that the highest estimation Admiral Rankling can form of me will not do justice to my devotion to my wife. Peggy, sotto voce. Oh, beautiful. Reginald, fiercely. And I should like to know the individual, old or young, who would take my wife from me. Mallory, to himself. Many a husband would like to know that person. In conclusion, as for Admiral Rankling's offer of a paternal friendship, I trust he will remember that offer if ever we should have occasion to remind him of it. Looking at his watch. And now I regret to say. The girls rise. The men follow. No, no, not before we have danced one quadrille. Oh, oh yes. yes, oh, oh yes. yes, a quadrille. quadrille. Uncle Veer will play for us. No, Uncle Veer will not. Oh, yes, you will, Quacket, old fellow. Eh? Well, I... With pleasure, Jack. To himself. How oh, dare they? Clear the floor. Saunders and Mallory, assisted by Ermatrude and Gwendolen, put back the table and chairs. Rankling, getting very good-humoured, Upon my soul, I never saw such girls in my life. I wonder whether my diner is anything like em. Dinah and Reginald are having a violent altercation. Why should it dance with a husband? It is horrible form. I can't see you let out by a stranger. It is merely a quadrille. Merely a quadrille? Woman, do you think I am marble? Dinah, distractedly, turning to Rankling. Admiral Rankling? Are you going to dance? Rankling, gallantly. If you do me the honour, my dear madam. She takes his arm. Reginald, madly, to Dinah. Ah, flirt! Quacket, to Peggy. Get rid of them soon, or I shall become a gibbering idiot. Mallory, slapping Quacket on the back. Now then, Quacket. Quacket goes to the piano. To Peggy. Will you make me happy, dear Miss Peggy? Thank you, Mr. Mallory. I never dance. Taking his arm. But I don't mind this once. Uncle. Quacket to himself. I wash my hands of the entire party. He plays the first figure of a quadrille while they dance. Rankling and Dinah, Saunders and Gwendolen, Mallory and Peggy, Ermertrude and Reginald. They dance with brightness and animation, but whenever Reginald encounters Dinah, there is a violent altercation. As the figure ends, Jane enters again, and runs to Quecket at the piano. What is it? Oh, sir, do come downstairs, as far down as you can get. What do you mean? That boy, Tyler, sir. Tyler? Well? He went off bang in the kitchen, sir, about ten minutes ago. Them fireworks. Fireworks? Where is he? Gone for the engines, sir. Quacket, rising. The engines? Uncle. Uncle Veer. Now then, Uncle. Excuse me. Let somebody take my place at the piano. I, uh, I'll be back in a moment. Jane hurries out. 
he following her. Peggy, running to the piano and commencing a waltz, A waltz, change partners. Rankling dances with Ermatrude, Saunders with Gwendolen. Reginald is left out, but is wildly following Dinah, who is dancing with Mallory. Not so fast, Miss Griffin, not so fast. Reginald, in Dinah's ear, I shall require some explanation, madam. A Reginald! There is the sound of a prolonged knocking at the street door, followed by a bell ringing violently. Peggy, playing. Somebody wants to come in, evidently. Suddenly the music and the dancing stop and everybody listens. Then they all run to the windows and look out. What's that? What's wrong? Oh, look there. Oh, there's such a crowd at our house. Quacket re-enters with Jane, who sinks into a chair. Quacket looks very pale and frightened. Listen to me, please. What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the, What's the matter? What's the matter? What's, What's the, matter? the matter? Don't be alarmed. Look at me. Imitate my self-possession. What is the matter? What is the matter? What is, is the, matter? the matter? What is the matter? What is the matter? What is the matter? What is the matter? The matter. The weather is so unfavorable that the boy, Tyler, has been compelled to display fireworks on the premises. Oh! oh. What, what has, has happened? happened? Pray, don't be disturbed. There is not the slightest occasion for alarm. We now have the choice of one alternative. What's, What's that? that? To get out without unnecessary delay. The girls, clustering together. Oh! oh. Rankling, assuming the tone of a commander. Mr. Murray! Mr. Saunders! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mallory and Saunders place themselves beside Rankling. Ladies, fetch your cloaks and wraps preparatory to breaking up a pleasant little party. Who volunteers to assist the ladies? I, sir. I, sir. I do. I do. Mr. Mallory, tell off Mr. Quirkett and Mr. Jenkinson to help the ladies. The girls run out, followed by Reginald, Quirkett, and Jane. Mr. Mallory, Mr. Saunders. Yes, yes sir. sir. All respective coats. They bustle about to get their coats as the door quietly opens, and Jaffrey, a fireman, appears. Good evening, gentlemen. Can you tell me where I'll find the ladies? They're putting on their hats and cloaks. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm much obliged to you. He goes to the window, pulls up the blind, and throws the window open. The top of a ladder is seen against the balcony. Are you coming up, Mr. Goff? Goff, out of sight. Yes, Mr. Jeffrey. Goff, a middle-aged, jolly-looking fireman, enters by the balcony and the window. Gentlemen? Mr. Goff, one of the oldest and most respected members of the brigade. Mr. Goff tells some most interesting stories, gentlemen. Rankling, impatiently. Stories, sir? Call the ladies, Mr. Murray. Mallory goes out. I shouldn't hurry them, sir. Ladies like to take their time. Now, I remember an incident in October 78. Confound it, sir! You're not going to relate anecdotes now? I beg your pardon, sir. Mr. Goff is one of the most experienced and entertaining members of the brigade. I tell you I don't care about that just now. Where are the ladies? Saunders goes out. Excuse me, sir. Mr. Goff's reminiscences are well worth hearing while you wait. But I don't wish to wait. Mallory and Peggy, Saunders and Gwendolyn, Reginald and Dinah, followed by Jane, enter. The girls are hastily attired in all sorts of odd apparel and carrying bonnet boxes, parcels, and small handbags. Ermatrude carries, amongst other things, a cage of white mice, Gwendolyn a bird in a cage, and Dinah a black cat, and Peggy a pair of skates and a brush and comb. We are ready. Take, take, take us away. away. I must really ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to take it quietly for a few minutes. Take, take it, it quietly. Take what it for? Take it what quietly. for? Take it quietly. What for? Take it quietly. What for? 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 What for?
the staircase isn't just the thing for ladies and gentlemen at the present moment i shall have to ask the ladies and gentlemen to use the escape all turning to the window the escape the escape where, the escape. where is it where is it the escape, the escape. Where, where is it? it it'll be here in two minutes in the meantime i think mr goff could while away the time very pleasantly with a reminiscence or two ladies mr goff Oh, oh, take, take us, us away. away! Take, take us, us away. away! Mallory, Saunders, and Reginald sue the ladies. Jaffrey goes to the window and looks out. Goff, pleasantly seating himself and taking off his helmet. Well, ladies, I, I don't know that I can tell you much to amuse you. However... Be quiet, sir. We will not be entertained! Jaffrey, carrying a hose from the window to the door really gentlemen i must say i've never heard mr goff treated so hasty at any conflagration he carries the hose out a fireman full of anecdote i decline to appreciate any reminiscence whatever so do we all certainly all of us it was in july seventy nine ladies my wife had just brought my tea to the chando street station jaffrey re-enters and goes to the window will you be silent sir get up and do something go away the escape ladies and gentlemen that window one at a time there is a general movement and hubbub goff rises he and joffrey disappear by the window on the left mallory throws open the other window and joffrey appears outside and receives dinah gwendolen ermatrude peggy and jane as they escape Mr. Mallory! Mr. Saunders! Good evening. Reginald disappears by the right-hand window. Saunders goes after him. Mallory is about to follow when Quecket enters hurriedly. Quecket is in a tall hat, a short covert coat, and carries gloves and an umbrella. He is flourishing a letter. Quecket, pulling Mallory back. Jack! Jack! Hello. I'm going back to save some valuables. Directly you get down, post that letter. Oh, Jack, it's so important. Mallory, looking at the letter. To the Eagle Fire Insurance Company. Quite so. Slipped my memory. Mallory disappears. Jaffrey follows him. Rankling, hurrying to Quecket. My dear Quecket, it is the commander's duty to be the last to leave the ship. You are master here. Thank you for your hospitality. Good night. My dear Rankling, thank you for coming to see me. Good night. Jaffrey appears at the window. It's all right, gentlemen. There's a kind lady down below who is taking everybody into her house for the night. Mrs. Ranklin of Portland Place. Mrs. Ranklin? That's my wife. Quacket disappears. Is she, sir? Glad to hear it. Then they are all your visitors till tomorrow. Confound it, sir! Where do I live? Just at the corner here, sir. A hundred yards off. Then where am I now? Miss Diet's boarding school, sir. Valumnia College. What? He and Jaffrey go out by the window on the right as Goff enters by the window on the left. Where is he? calling at the door sir here's the lady of the house rode up on an engine from piccadilly make haste she says she will come up the ladder quacket enters quickly dragging after him several boxes of cigars a lady what lady miss diot peers at the window she is in the gorgeous dress of an opera bouffe queen with a flaxen wig much disarranged and a crown on one side recoiling Caroline! Miss Diot, entering and taking him by the collar. Come down. She drags him towards the window. End of the second act.